Hello, UJTV viewers. Welcome to another insightful conversation of In Conversation. My name is Bongani Mnube, and today we are joined by Prof Khan. Prof Khan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Yes, it is quite an honor to have you as um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics. Big thank name. Thank you. And a big <laughs> position. <laughs> It is, but it's a shorter title. You can just say DVC academic and it's much shorter. Much shorter. And well, true. Yeah. But that was for you who do not know um, what DVC would mean in, in this case. Well, Prof, I think we'll take it straight from the very beginning, I believe. Okay, it's not the real beginning, but you are a first generation graduate in your family. Yes. And I, I personally resonate to that. And I think with most students in our institution also resonate. Um, how does it feel for you? Uh, to having been the first generation graduate. Um, you know, and I'm glad that you say that you resonate with that as well. Um, for many of us, I think what is important for me when I speak to my students is that there's that resonation and they can align. When they look at somebody, I think everybody has a preconceived notion about who somebody is yes. based on what their current position is. And so for me, it's important that students know that my my current position doesn't define my history. My history is growing up on the Cape Flats in the Western Cape. My history is being raised by a single mother. My history is being first generation. Um, and and that, that, that encompasses a lot. It's, it, it means that when we went to university, we were the first, there was nobody who can show us the ropes, nobody who could have those words of wisdom with us as to what you can expect, what's going to be those key pointers that's going to help you to succeed. You go there and you try and fit in as best as possible. Yes. Try not to show <coughs> that it's your first, first time, time at a university. Yeah. Make good friends and just be very grateful for the blessings that you were given. But you know, it's, I'm sure you can also relate. When you go to graduation, it's not a graduation for just you. First of all, I'm one of twins. So my first undergraduate qual was my sister and I. Um, and it was Desmond Tutu who was the chancellor for UWC. So that in itself was a special moment. But then you've got your mother and you've got your father um, and you've got your um, grandmother and they want to know, what must you wear? Must you say anything? Where must you sit? So for everyone, it's this moment of yes. pride, nervousness, but just it's for me, what was special, I think, is having my support system with me. Because I, I always say I am nobody without, I, I'm, I couldn't have achieved what I've achieved in life without the Lord and without my support system. And I'm very grateful for that blessing in my life. And so to share that with my father, he's passed away since then. And my grandmother, she's passed away since then. But they were there. And I think back on that time, and I just think, that nervous energy, that pride was a shared moment of family. And I'm very blessed that we could have experienced that. Now, of course, as you go through, you said you're studying your master's. Yes. You've gone through an undergrad and honors and now it's your master's and hopefully your PhD. So by the time it comes to the PhD, we've done four graduations. We old hands, <laughs> but that first one, that first oh, one. it was a moment of pride, a, a moment of hard work. Um, but not just academics, my support system helped me and created an environment that allowed me to succeed. And so I'm very grateful for that, honestly. Wow. And it, it is indeed. I can, I can, and in my resonance, it's like walking up that stage, they're calling your name and you just sit, you're nervous standing there, walking <laughs> with your smile. The camera yes. is just all over. Yes. That Where one. must you stand? How long do you yeah. have? What must you do? Must you kneel? <laughs> must you bend? Must you, <laughs> what, you know, I fell in front of this. <laughs> Are you that nervous? So, so my moment <laughs> is, my moment, my <laughs> advice is don't wear heels for the first time. You'll notice I'm wearing sneakers. <laughs> don't wear heels to your graduation if you don't know how to wear heels. But I felt, and my, I always picture him capping me, but laughing as he was capping me. And that moment was so <laughs> precious because yeah. while I was embarrassed, I made Desmond Tutu <laughs> laugh. And no one else did. Everyone was and just no formal. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that is also a very well, special, a special moment. Special moment. <laughs> What a way to make an impression. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So moving from that, and now you're the DVC academic. Yeah. How has that journey been for you? Sure. You know, um, it's an interesting question because I don't know that when I was at varsity. My ambition was to be a deputy vice chancellor academic. I don't even know that many of us knew who our deans were when we were in our faculties, right? And so to say that this is what I always wanted to be is not the truth. It's who I am very happy to be right now. But that journey of science and research and virology and molecular biology and my speciality that was what i always wanted to do teaching in front of a class brought me happiness mm -hmm. and so if i think of my journey there are pockets of you know happiness that we have and experience things that make us happy and so through my journey it's obviously evolved right but um Certainly, academia made me happy. Research made me happy. Teaching, standing in front of a class, made me happy. You shared that you um, rap. Yes. My <laughs> students used to say, um, "That woman raps when she's in front." I am no way as talented as you, <laughs> but but you understand. You engage, yes, and you engaging. you are an actor when you're in front of a class, and that brought me happiness. Yes. And then later in life, management and leadership brought me happiness. Um, and what I've experienced and learned about myself is, I'm happy if my work environment brings me happiness. And so, as I've taken over the role of HOD, become a dean, I've realized that when you are in those positions, you are in a position to make positive change. And so, I don't think of my position as a position of power or money. Or influence, or title, because that would be a job, isn't it? Yeah, If I true. thought of it in that way, it means I'm coming to a job every day. It's, It's a position that allows me to influence change in a very positive way, to recognize that we've got a problem with student success, and to work with a team of great people that I work with, to ensure that we implement things and efforts and events. To impact student success, to recognize that we have a responsibility to equip our staff to be the best teachers possible, and to work with the team again to see how we do that and impact them in a positive way. And so, when I look at this position that I now hold, yes. it's honestly for me a position that allows positive change, and yeah. that makes me happy. It makes me happy that. I'm able to have conversation with brilliant people and to work within a team where our joint vision objective is student success, staff happiness, equipping staff in a positive way. And I think that's why now, if you ask me, say, "How are you happy?" Yes. I'd say, "I am happy." That's I'm happy true. with what I'm able to do on a daily basis. Yes. And that is why that journey of academia, of research, equipped me to be an empathetic DVC academic because I've gone through the ranks. It's not that I've come here and jumped and now I'm not. I can't empathize with the struggles of a lecturer. I can't empathize with the struggles of a student or um, a, a researcher or an HOD or a, a dean. I've done that. I know what your struggles are. So how do we support each other to ensure that you are successful? And I think that that makes me happy that I'm in a position to do that. Yeah, literally, because yeah. you've been in those shoes, you can easily relate to what Correct. they are going through. Correct. And having been um, through your journey, health sciences has been at the epicenter yes. of, yes. of it all. Yeah. Where did the love begin? Okay. Tell us more about your passion yeah. for health and sciences. I would say when I was doing my masters, um, I was fortunate enough to be employed. And when I say employed, it's semi-employed by the Agricultural Research Council. So they had a program called the Professional Development Program, um, and they employed master students to come and work at the the Agricultural Research Council. But complete your masters, basically. Yeah. That's what you were able to do. And there, I I was exposed to viruses for the first time. 
So I, I worked with fungi and bacteria and viruses under the umbrella of microbiology. Yes. And viruses brought along molecular biology, genetics. And that is really my happy place where changer. research is concerned. <laughs> yes. So when I had to make the decision for my PhD, I continued in virology. Right, and I was able to complete my PhD at UWC, but also spending a year in the Netherlands. So I worked uh, in a lab in Wageningen in the Netherlands, and I finished my PhD, and I got a job. And soon after I got a job, maybe two years, I realized I love teaching, like I said, but I'm not really involved in research anymore. So I went to my HOD and I said, look, I know I've just recently employed but I'm not publishing. And so I took a year unpaid leave and I went and did a postdoc in Singapore. And that's where I really got to work with human viruses. And I worked with coronavirus, SARS, the original, in 2005, the original, <laughs> the, the parent, if you may, yes. um, of the one that, that the, the, the SARS-CoV-2. And that it just elicited a, a, a deep love and appreciation for virology for viruses, for molecular biology, and under the umbrella of health sciences. And so I'm, like I said, my happiness is very important mm, to me. True. And those triggers that enhance my happiness are important. And so I always re-evaluate what my happiness index is, for lack of a better description. Um, and so health sciences and working in a lab and publishing and working with good people, yes. really who added value to my knowledge and enhanced my knowledge base, elicited a love for health sciences, for biomedical sciences. And so when I came back and worked in biomed, mm -hmm. it brings in a new passion, right? Yes, Because suddenly you, you're invigorated, you're happy to be back, and that passion you carry over to your students. And so that journey has just continued. What was your take on the SARS-2 when it <gasps> came up? I wish I was in a, in a, in a, in a, in a classroom. In a classroom, I'll tell you why. Yes. Because I we would have had such amazing debates with my students and conversation to say, look at the mutation rate of this, look at the different variants that we're having, look at the vaccine development, let's talk about the safety of the vaccines, the technology that they're using. It would have been such good conversational topics within a classroom. I bemoaned the fact that I wasn't teaching in the global pandemic. I never thought I would have lived through a global pandemic. <laughs> never. never. But if and now that I did, it brings first-hand experience yes. that, that augments your teaching when you're in a classroom. <gasps> oh, those conversations would have been good. I always think of teaching as a conversation with the class, yeah. rather than me imparting, imparting information. It's a conversation, it's a, and yes. I would have enjoyed that time. However, we recognize the impact of the global pandemic from an educational perspective. Oh my word! Oh, it would have been amazing to be in front of a class during that time. No, I wish I could have been in your class actually. <laughs> Though your class sounds so nice. Oh, I love teaching. Yes. Absolutely love teaching. Wow, yeah. very interesting. So now we post COVID-19, and of course the university suffered a lot in, in that regard. Um, what are some of the programs that we're having currently at UJ? Because we, of course, um, have quality academic programs, yeah. some of which are sought after in, yeah. in the country. Yeah. So can you mention to us probably one example of a program that is successful, like the accountancy department? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you think of the accountancy domain here at UJ, you'd be hard pressed to not link Amanda, the, the, the senior director yes. of the accounting um, domain, the school, to success. And I think every student will probably think of her in a very positive way. And if you think about the, the, the positive memories we have, the impact that we leave on students, the success of our education, it rests solely on the success and the passion of our lecturing staff, from my perspective. When, when you go into a classroom and you love what you do, and you impart joy and passion and knowledge, and you are super competent, and you are able to have positive discussion, debate, and elicit that kind of critical thinking in your class, that impacts students. And I think when they think back on that journey, then they are going to remember particular people who impacted their lives as part of their journey. And so for me, when we think of excellence in education, we need to start and thank 
our academic staff. We need to recognize that our success hinges in what they do in a classroom, in how they engage with students. And you know, having been a lecturer, I can share with you, it, there gets a point when you're teaching for a few years, yes. where you forget why you're doing it. <laughs> you Honestly, I'm going to be honest with you, yes. it becomes such Second a pattern yeah. and repetitive cycle that you've heard it all, students talk to you and they provide you with excuses and you're like, don't fool me, I know exactly what you're going to say. And you forget that you're here because you love students. You have a deep appreciation and you are invested in their success. And I'm, a, I'm ashamed to say that I was teaching probably for about six years yes. and I got into that pattern. I was such a, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to do this again. I'm gonna have to teach the same thing again. And you know what, I, I actually had to make a conscious decision and it is actually a prayer and I said, and people laugh when I said, I don't know why, because it's such a simple prayer. And I said, Lord, give me a love for students. Just, let me just love them. Let me just appreciate them. Yes. They are human beings who are here trying to better their life. Sure. And let me help them to be successful. And that changed and reignited and gave me almost a second chance and passion for going back into a classroom and saying, you know what, yes. I know I'm teaching this for the 10th year in a row, but you, you're hearing it for the first time. And let me just be as animated and passionate and infused as possible. And and that is what lecturers do every single day. They walk into that classroom and impart knowledge. And I'm so grateful that we are successful, but I'm so mindful that it's because of them and the hard work and effort they put in to ensure that our students are competent, that they absorb, um, and that they are successful. So I think our success hinges on people and that people being our staff. And so I'm very grateful for wow. them. Well, I like that part that you asked you asked the Lord for a hand and he gave you an arm in terms yes. of the love for students because yeah. right now you have an abundance love. I can feel yeah. that you love students, you I love really being do. in front of the class. Yeah. Yes. And yes. sticking on people there, um, would you say that staff recruitment is part of the game plan? Um, as you're saying that they are important yeah. people. We yeah. are solely based yeah. on people. Yeah. We obviously want to recruit the best of the best. Yes. But the best of the best would mean they've got a master's, they've got a doctorate, but that, that's academic, right? That's an academic accolade, for lack of a better description. But from our perspective, I always say two things, and I know PhDs hate when I say this, but I say it anyway, and I hope they understand it's coming from a place of love. A PhD doesn't mean that you are an excellent teacher. And a PhD doesn't mean that you are an excellent leader or manager. What it does mean is that you have the ability to excel and learn. Mm. And that I'm grateful for. But it does mean that when we recruit our staff, we have to equip them to be excellent academics, right? Mm. Excellent teachers, excellent researchers, excellent leaders and managers because they manage their, their subject and their domain. They have to be empathetic. They have to care about their students. Mm -hmm. And so staff recruitment goes above, beyond what the requirements are for the job. It's how successful you are, leading to the previous answer. How successful are you when you're standing in front of that classroom? How engaged are you? How invested are you? Are you vested in their success? Is it important to you? Do you have a model compass that you know, oh, you know what, that one assessment that I just gave, that question that I gave was unfair because I didn't cover it. Are you able to go back and say, you know what, class, I'm taking out that question. I've now realized that maybe I didn't equip you enough to answer that question. Are you burdened by being an ethical person? You, you, you get True. what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So staff recruitment for us, the support divisions we have here really do an excellent job with equipping staff with a toolkit to be successful. I'm very grateful to them. Division of Teaching Excellence, CAT, ADS, all of them do an excellent job to help our staff be the best they can. And so for me, staff recruitment means welcome to you, Jay. Let us support you to be the best academic that you can possibly be. That's so important for me, it's very honestly. Important. Yeah. yeah. And you've highlighted some of the measures, I think, that are leading to my next question, which is um, how is the institution adapting its curriculum to ensuring that students are equipped with skills and um, 
knowledge needed for 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 jobs in the future mm -hmm. i think you you've hinted how already starting charity beginning at home yeah. um a person reflecting on a question engaging with the students and then that already on its own um equip equips okay. students yes so just to add on that can, can you kindly um also highlight how are we equipping students for jobs in the future in mm. various departments yeah so if, if you consider that that is our uh, our job is not just to impart knowledge, right? It's it's to ensure that when they graduate, they are competent, super competent. We don't want to say competent. We want to say that they are already professionals where knowledge is concerned. Mm -hmm. But they must be energized as well to want to make an impact within their profession. Um, and so they must be competitive within the, the market, the employment market, right? So we need to ensure that when we're looking at our students, we're not just thinking of them as somebody who must have academic knowledge. Because academic knowledge isn't going to set you apart from somebody at WITS or somebody at UCT or somebody at UP. It needs to be other attributes that we need to position them with, equip them with, that sets them apart. And excitement and enjoyment, being people who are um, um, good citizens, yes. having a model compass, coming there with the knowledge of, if I'm going to go into an interview, what are the type of questions? How am I going to answer those questions? When somebody mm. says, tell me about yourself, mm. they don't want to know, I used to run around in nappies and I used to, <laughs> they want you to, to see how, how are you going to, in a Reader's Digest version, mm. sell your best attributes. And, and that's the kind of things we do. Our psychiatrist, it's not just psycho, they have a graduate employability section as well, uh, where they really support graduates and they provide, and they work with the SRC for interview skills, setting up your CV, right? Dressing for the part that you want is so important. It's also uh, an event or, 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 or certainly a category or area that they try and engage students with. The MOOCs that we have, the financial literacy MOOCs, the, the MOOC on artificial intelligence, on the SDGs, to have a social conscious. Yes. All of these things ensure that we have a well-rounded human being who's a good citizen, who has a social conscious and environmental conscious. And I think that is where UJ, we try to set ourselves apart yes. with why we say, Take our students, mm -hmm. because our students, are we always successful now? But do we try constantly? Yes. And that is what I think sets our students apart. That we've, we, we know that it's a holistic human being that's multidimensional that we have to feed when they come to the university not just academics. I like that you touched on um, the SDGs. It is, um, we, the, the global, um, the world, in a sense, has that focus on sustainability and environmental responsibility. So as an institution, how are we incorporating the sustainability practices into um, academic, into academic program and yeah. curricula? Yeah. Oh, it, I just mentioned the MOOC now that we have, right? And that MOOC is not only free, to our students or our staff, but it's free to the public as well. Because we recognize, when I think of the SDGs, I, I say we, we mustn't address the SDGs because it's a tick box. It is a social conscious activity that we must be burdened to address because if we do not, there will literally be no earth, no environment for future generations. And so that's the thought process, that burden of social conscious was an environmental and economical conscious was the reason the SDGs were developed. And with that in mind, we must understand, and I think that's what the MOOC does. The MOOC tries to share with you exactly the importance of the SDGs, what they are and why it's important that we address them. So that MOOC is one way. But from our perspective, if you think of Professor Mpedi and, and as he comes in as VC, he brought in GES 4.0 for societal impact. And what is a better way of societal impact than addressing the SDGs? So I think with him, he brings a, a humanitarian approach of social conscious as well. And so almost everything that we're doing, our new strategic plan, the way that we are thinking about our curricula and how we are incorporating the SDGs in everything that we teach is positively contributing to an improvement and addressing in some very small way the SDGs. The research that we embark on at the university from um, water quality, 
research. I myself am, am involved in water quality, but from your faculty of engineering, your PEATS, your faculty of science, your faculty of health sciences, all of them are working together to address water quality. They are great work that CBE is doing in the economics and economic growth domain. Education, quality education is our bread and butter but it's also a positive impact for the faculty of education. And so you'd be hard pressed to convince me that there isn't a support division or an academic entity here who is not consciously making an effort to address the SDGs because they understand the importance thereof and not because it's a tick box. Mm. That's important. To That's me. very important. And, yeah. and I, I like also that, I'm seemingly liking everything that you're saying actually. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I honestly like uh, the, the higher education, the quality education that yeah. is the, our footprint that, that we're having as an institution. And so moving within that, um, the quality of higher education, it is, of course, an important aspect of nation development. Yeah. And I just want to find out how is the university um, prompting inclusive, inclusivity and diversity in its student body to ensure that all qualifying students from different backgrounds yeah. are actually enrolled into the yeah. institution? Yeah. So, you know, from our perspective, we have always regarded ourselves as access for excellence. And that is something our vice chancellor always says, uh, quality and quantity are not mutually exclusive. Access and excellence are not mutually exclusive. And I think if you look at our track record of where we come from, prior merger, merger to where we are now, 68% of our students are from quintile one to three. True. Now we recognize that, right? Yes. And we recognize what that means growing up on the Western Cape, in the Western Cape on the Cape Flats. Yes. I'm that demographic. Right? And so from that perspective, it means that when you come into a university situation, its fees are of primary importance. 68%, or is it 62%, sorry, of our students are NISFAS grant holders. Now think about that, right? NISFAS grant holders. But that does mean that there's a portion that are not receiving that funds. We've got the SRC Trust Fund that's able to support 2,000 students, or the Trust Fund. Our Department of Fundraising and Development under Daphne and the CFO, they've seen the seriousness of student fees and they have raised over one billion in the last five years for student fees. We've just had a walk, a future walk on, on Saturday that raised fees, that raised money for class fees. So when we say that, that we say, come to UJ, Mm. And we understand that we want to open our doors for excellent students who are coming from particular demographics. We're also saying we understand that there are needs that you have. And fees is one of those needs. Finance is a part of that need. And so UJ goes beyond what I think other universities do related to ensuring that our students have the ability to concentrate on studies and not worry to a great extent about fees. We really make that effort. We aren't able to help everyone. Yes. Understand that. Sure. But we help as many as we can with what we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. I can talk about the feeding scheme, the food parcels that we give. I mean, uh, from our perspective, when you drive into APK on a Monday morning, your heart breaks when you're looking at that line. But it would break more if that line didn't exist and the parcels weren't there and the food packages weren't there. Because that would mean that there would be a cohort of students who wouldn't be able to survive for a week or two weeks. Right? Yes. And so it's that kind of support that we're also able to bring. And, and I really honestly be believe that UJ goes above and beyond to recognize that there are particular needs for students that we must try to address so that we can support them to be the best student possible. I think we do a great job there, honestly, I think. And speaking on the, the future work, which was, of course, to, to also assist the missing medal, as it speaks to what you are saying, that we try to understand that there are differences and to come from different backgrounds yeah. and to try to cater yeah. for those uh, yeah. separately as well. Yeah, which, correct. Which is very powerful. And you can recognize that it's very important to our vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. He walked on Saturday, right? He did walk. He's the last man standing. Yeah, he's like, always yes. in almost every speech or presentation talking about the funds that we are doing, the funds that we need, reminding people to contribute. And I think that trickles down because you recognize that it's important. And so you emphasize it as well. Yes. And I think it starts at the top, really it, it does. And top. so I must admire him for that humanitarian approach that he has. Mm. 
and yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, we're moving to a different type of feeling. Of course, the world is evolving yeah. and we, for IR, now we almost talk about the fifth industrial revolution. Yeah. So, um, well, one of the most debatable issues related to technological advancement has been the advent of ChatGPT. Ah. Uh, in terms of, um, as, a, as a tool, for research and a writing tool. Yeah. So I just want to find out what's your take because we have embraced for the yeah. industrial revolution. We've been um, been at the advent of uh, yeah. technological advancements. Yeah. So what is your take on for and chat GPT yeah. and should we embrace it or yeah. should we As not? As a generative AI, right? Yeah, you know, I'm a proponent of, of generative AI. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I have to write an email and I type the paragraph and then I go to ChatGPT and I say, please rewrite. And I put my paragraph in and they rewrite in a way that is, oh, poor excellence. <laughs> it's so brilliant. Yes. It's, but from my perspective, I think they are Barri not barriers, boundaries that I allowed myself to use ChatGPT. If it's me putting a paragraph down and asking them to check the spelling or the grammar, to check the accuracy of the facts, to, to, to rewrite a paragraph where I, for instance, said the, sub the submission is submitted and I sit there and I go, now that doesn't sound right. And then I put it into ChatGPT and said, please rewrite. And it comes up in a way that I just wouldn't have in that moment thought of. Thought of, yes. I, I'm a proponent of that. Mm. I, I support that. Mm. But I think from our perspective at UJ, we have recognized generative AI. And we have accepted that it's here. And we're not putting our head in the sand. We're not saying, look, guys, we must tell our students that they can't use it and blah, blah, blah. Our Division of Teaching Excellence has come up with three teaching practice guides, right? One for students, one for staff, and one with just normal review information as to the impact of generative AI. Our faculties are providing position papers as to how they are going to handle it within the faculties, right? And so we've certainly done, made inroads into addressing generative AI. But I think a few things are important. One, that we need to provide our students with clear guidelines when it comes to the use of ChatGPT. Yes. If I was still teaching, I would sit in my class, I would speak to them, and my first lecture would be, let's talk about what I accept as how and when you can use ChatGPT, right? If, if I'm giving you an assignment, there are going to be opportunities where I'll say to you, you can use ChatGPT to check your facts, to maybe polish what you're saying, but you have to put a disclaimer informing me the level of which you've used ChatGPT so that I'm aware that you've used the technology, right? And then there are going to be other assessments where I'm going to say, no, I'm not in this assessment yes. going to, because I, I want to actually have your input, your thoughts, see you coming through yes. in a particular um, assessment. But there are also things that we can do. We can not let them write and copy and paste. <laughs> we can let them record themselves in a video, yes, right? Yes. Do a little video and, and tell me what you think PC polymerase chain reaction means. Mm. Talk to me, have, have a conversation, answer these questions. Yes. We also have to be innovative as to how we are going to incorporate ChatGPT. It's here. I don't think we can deny that it's here. And there's certainly, I think, ways that we can allow it to augment our teaching. And then there are other ways we're going to discourage it. As long as we have an open and honest conversation with our students that says, we're going to have ethical boundaries as to where you can use it and how you tell me that you've used it. And if I find out, unfortunate, because ChatGPT is great. You can put the writing in and say, did you write this? And even if you put it into that, this AI technology yes. that will rewrite ChatGPT, wow. I've tested it. It yes. still recognizes its own work, even if you use the other technology to rewrite. Yes. So from my perspective, just be open and honest and use it within the framework that we provide. Yes. And then I think we'll all be okay. I think that's important. True. And yes, I think a guideline or a framework yeah. Yeah. That, that is stated and out there for, for both. And as you've said, there is one for students, the staff, yeah. and the general yeah. rule of thumb. Yeah. Well, 
I would also like to know what are the concerns that don't give you that give you a sleepless night rather would you say maybe plagiarism since we're talking about chat gpt someone did not yeah. cite properly um yeah. what are some of the the concerns that yeah. you have in the institutions i'm hoping every person who works with me will be able to answer that question because i tell them often enough student success keeps me up at night you know the chair of council absolutely brilliant in person a woman she asked me that question one day and I didn't even have to think about it. Student success keeps me up. Um, students not completing in minimum time. Our low number of graduate outputs. Students dropping out. That keeps me up. Where, as a first generation, you started by asking me that. Imagine if I didn't complete my undergrad. I, here's a fact. I wouldn't be able to be a DVC of anything <laughs> without an <laughs> undergrad, okay. postgrad, and PhD. If I did not complete and I dropped out, my career trajectory, my, my entire history, my life would have taken a very different way. It roots, right? So I worry about that. I look at students when I was a dean and we had the infamous F7 meetings. I would read those reasons and I, I wish I could have sat with students, held their hand and said, why did you do this? Why are your reasons for not finishing I partied, I didn't pay enough attention. Because there are other students who come with serious problems yes. and we assist those students. But I wanna take that cohort who doesn't take that opportunity seriously. Seriously. I wanna hold their hand and say, yes. this has the ability to change your life. Mm. And so student success as an umbrella keeps me up because I want students to finish. Because I know of the economic change in their life and that of their family having a qualification it can impact them in a positive way. And so for me, that keeps me up. And, and we are working as a team now um, with the faculties, with the support divisions to implement many policies, processes. First, recognize why they are dropping out, why they are taking longer, and then implementing many, many processes to support students. Because I, I want to, in five years' time, when my term is up, I want to see a positive influence on a positive influence on completion in minimum time, mm -hmm. a decrease in dropout rate. Because while it's just an indicator, it <coughs> means more students are graduating with a qualification. On your behalf, I think I'm pleading to the students yeah. not to make you grow old fast. No, please don't. I beg <laughs> must, you. I let's beg make sure you. that you remain young forever, yeah. sweet 16. Please, I beg you. <laughs> yes. So, well, in closing, um, what are your, what is your vision for the University of Johannesburg? <sighs> and how do you see it uh, contributing to the advancement of education and society in the mm -hmm. years to come? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is such a, people always expect somebody in academia to say, um, to give a very academic answer. Hey? Yeah, true. <laughs> I would be very happy we spoke about graduate employability. I would be very happy if the students that we graduate are good freaking people. I would be very happy if they contribute in a very positive way to society because they have an unwavering model compass. Mm. They are super competent in what they do. Yes. They know what they do. Their happiness index is great. They take pride in the people that they are. They have an unwavering model compass and they're just good freaking people. Because I think if, if that is your mantra, to be a person of good character, mm -hmm. then you can make a positive impact no matter what you do. And I, I would be a very happy person if we are graduating students beyond academic competence, but we're graduating people with good character, people who positively contribute to society, who are burdened by a social conscious, I think that would make me a very happy person if that's the type of graduate that we have, because they would impact almost every avenue of our society. Yeah. They, they reflect what the university is teaching, and we thank you for that. Yeah. You having been the uh, DVC of academia and hearing such love for students, I think that is also encouraging for, for a person who's still studying and about to graduate or to 
uh, going to the workspace, mm. which is very powerful. Thank you. I appreciate those yeah. kind words. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, anything else you'd like to add to our conversation as we close? No, just to say thank you to our staff, I suppose. Yes. To say that we all appreciate the hard work that staff, whether it be in an academic entity, whether it be in a support division, we recognize how, how difficult the past few years have been. We recognize their resilience. And we're truly just so appreciative that they come to work and they've still got that passion and love for students. Just to say thank you to them. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> well, that is the show for today. This has been In Conversation, and we were having a conversation with the DVC Academia, Prof Khan. My name is Bongani Mnube. I'll see you on the next episode. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.